Monica Ali is a Bangladeshi-born British writer and best-selling novelist whose work has been translated into over 26 languages. She was selected as one of the best of young British novelists by Granta magazine based on her unpublished manuscript, Brick Lane. It was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize and adapted into a 2007 film of the same name. She has multiple other works. Her latest effort, Love Marriage, recently having its TV rights sold successfully. It is my great pleasure and privilege to welcome my next guest in the waiting room, Monica Ali. Monica, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Pleasure. Thanks for having me here. Not at all. And as with so many of our guests, uh, I'd like to ask you to begin your journey with your parents and telling us about who they are and where were they born? So my mum is English and she was born in Preston in the northwest of England. Um, she met my father, who is Bangladeshi, at a dance in, uh, well actually it, it was in Bolton, I think, not Preston. Um, and that was in the early 1960s. Um, and they got together, uh, which was a terrible thing that, that my father did in terms of his own family because um, he had promised his dad that he would get married to the girl that had been chosen for him after he'd finished his studies abroad. But then my mum came along and ruined that plan. Um, he went back to Dhaka. It was East Pakistan then, it wasn't yet Bangladesh. Um, he went back to Dhaka and my mother followed on six months later. She had some things to, to do before um, she went uh, and transferred her whole life to the other side of the world. Um, and they spent uh, seven or eight years there. Uh, I was born in 67 and then the war broke out, the War of Independence broke out in 1971 and that's when uh, my mother took me and my brother and came to England. Mm. What was the um, experience of your mother coming to Dhaka and, and what was the sort of reception for her when she came? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, that's something that's fascinated me <laughs> all, all my life, really. Um, and I think in some ways it, it linked into my first novel, because although the, the heroine, the protagonist of Brick Lane, has the opposite journey to my mum, I think I always had in the back of my mind, you know, what's it like to, to, to just see everything through, it's almost like, an alien's eyes, you know, the, the sort of Martian poetry that Craig Rain wrote, you know, that idea of defamiliarization. How does the world look to somebody who just dropped into it as she, as she was at the time? Because um, she went there not knowing the language, not knowing anything about the culture, not really knowing much about their religion, not having any contacts there apart from my dad. Um, so, I, I think that was a very intense experience. There's lots of stories that I've heard about that. It was also very intense for my father because his, fa his father cut him off mm. um, because he had lost face, basically, and they never really repaired that damage. Can you tell us any of your earliest memories there? Only really around the time of when the the war broke out and it was a time of terrible turmoil and violence, and we, we had to um, <laughs> hide under the bed when the troops were going past, and there were you know tanks rolling in the street, and there was a plan um, that if that they came into the building. There was a, a, 
balcony and there's a particular mango tree that you could reach from the from the balcony and it was all carefully planned out how, how we would have to who would go first into the tree and pass the children over so i remember that sort of sense of um just tension i think and fear rather than uh rather than any of the specifics the specifics i probably learnt yes. as a as a story later but that sense of oh my gosh the world can change in a moment you know everything that you've got everything that you have everything that you know can just go like that is i think the sense that maybe i still carry to a certain extent i don't tend to take things for granted too much i feel the fragility of of life so but my, my mum brought me and my brother we had to go to the airport several times over because everyone all the expats and other people were trying to get out and you know we we had to sort of make our way through the crowds try and push through the crowds to get to the aeroplane um which we did eventually on the sort of i don't know fourth or fifth attempt uh, my dad wasn't allowed to leave because they weren't letting any um well, East Pakistan nationals out. So we had to make that journey uh, without him. Um, and my mum was very worried that me and my brother would start speaking Bengali on <laughs> in the airport and we wouldn't be allowed on. So she was stuffing us with uh, boiled sweets to keep, keep us quiet. And then, you know, suddenly the world changed because then we were, um, in England. What happened next in your journey? So my um, maternal grandparents had been actually fine with my mum marrying uh, my dad. Um, I think because at the time there were hardly any Asian immigrants in the north west of England and most that were there were students and it wasn't you know, it wasn't such a terrible thing. <laughs> uh, but by the time we returned, there'd been quite a, a, a growth in the population. Um, mill workers, um, a lot of people were mill workers. And my grandparents just weren't terribly thrilled about um, my mum's uh, husband choice and her having these little brown children and they should say things like, my grandmother would say things like, well, you know, if you dress them carefully enough, nobody will, you know, maybe nobody will know or fewer people will know. So, which didn't go down very well with my mum. I mean, you know, I think it was much more traumatic for my mum, yes. to be honest, um, because I wasn't aware of, of a lot of that. Again, I was just aware of tension. <laughs> <laughs> and something missing, um, which was my dad. He was, so he spent six months in India, firstly in a refugee camp in, um, uh, near Cal in Calcutta and then elsewhere in India. But yeah, my mum was writing to the MP, her local MP and trying to get permission for him to come over. Meanwhile, uh, when he'd gone to the refugee camp, he'd seen the people who were organising and in charge and they'd asked to see his documents and they destroyed them, because, uh, his passport, because, I mean, these were from people from East Pakistan. They said, well, you know, you can't leave. You have to stay and help build mm. the new country. But of course, he wanted to be with his family. Of course, absolutely. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah. And then he eventually did? Yes, yes. Yeah, I think it took about six, seven months, something like that, and then he got permission to travel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something very interesting that you said was, I didn't really know what I wanted to be. All I knew was I wanted to be invisible. 
I mean, it, that, that, that I, I can't remember saying it, but it makes sense. Um, and I connect that to reading, actually, because novels, I mean, all books, but novels in particular, were an escape and they, they were the place that I could lose myself. But did you have a firm idea of who you were and what your identity was? We didn't talk in terms of identity back then. I mean, I don't think I'd ever heard the word identity by the time I left school. I mean, that wasn't a question. It wasn't raised. Um, so I certainly didn't think about it in those terms. Uh, I mean, for me, I, 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 to pick another even more newfangled terms, non-binary, I mean, everything for me is non-binary. It's not either or. It's, I am this and I am that. Um, and the frustration for me often lies, I think, in, in the idea that you should have a fixed self which reflects accurately to the outside viewer who you are, because who you are, or certainly in my case, is a constantly evolving, constantly shifting, constantly changing set of dynamic processes in relationship to the outside world. Um, and, you know, that's something that I've come to uh, appreciate even more as I get older. Mm. Um, and I think it's quite damaging that, that idea that um, you are one fixed thing or two fixed things. Absolutely. I mean, we all contain multitudes. And develop them over time yeah. with our experiences. Yeah. Was education important to you? Was it instilled upon you? Yes, yes, um, very firmly so. Um, but I, you know, I, enjoy, I enjoyed school, I enjoyed school work. Um, I was good at it, I was good at exams. Um, I got a free place, as did my brother, at the local independent school. Um, it was just a very good school, it was a girls' school, which was handy as well. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I, I worked hard for my O levels and my A levels and I saw it as a means of you know taking control of my life and my destiny. I didn't know what I wanted to do with it but I just thought that was yeah the way forward and the way out. Um, and you went to a, a very illustrious uh, institution uh, in pursuit mm. of your education. Can mm. you tell us about that? Yeah, so I went, I went to Wadham College, Oxford, and I studied uh, philosophy, politics, and economics. And my grandparents <laughs> took me down in their orange combi van, <laughs> camper van. <laughs> and everyone else was turning up with their parents with their, you know, big posh cars, and <laughs> I was bundling my my duvet out of there, a little camper van. Anyway, it was, yeah, it's funny looking back on it. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed my time at, at Wadham. It was, yeah, it was a great three years. And I, and I made so many friends there and some of them are, you know, still my best friends in life. And, and, and now you did other things before you became a writer. Mm. Yeah, I, I hadn't really found um, what I wanted to do in life, despite all this, you know, freedom that I'd been keen to have. And I think part of what had been holding me back was just f fear again. <laughs> I mean, it seemed kind of a ridiculous thing to do to want to write a novel, right? It's not... Yeah, I mean, didn't seem like a reasonable thing to 
want to do. I thought I should be earning some money and I, I, I had uh, young children. So, you know, when I went back to work, I should contribute to the household bills. And anyway, um, it was the day after my grandfather's funeral, I actually started writing what turned into Brick Lane. And as we know, that seminal writing of yours uh, turned into Brick Lane which enamoured fans all over the world uh, and as I've mentioned has been translated into over 26 languages, was turned into a film. Did you have any sense when you first were writing that any of that was what would follow? No, no I mean it's it's a book about a Bangladeshi housewife <laughs> and um, I would have had to have been you know crazy to think that that was going to be some kind of hit. I mean, who's interested in Bangladeshi housewives? Certainly not at that time that I was writing, um, back in 2000, 2001, definitely not. And it wasn't even a multicultural, cool kind of book. It's pretty monocultural. So that wasn't the goal, that wasn't the aim. There were things that I wanted to explain law in the writing I already mentioned you know my mum's experience of uh, uh, of going to Dhaka and that total sense of cultural social dislocation I was interested to explore that I wanted to see if I could write because that novels have always meant so much to me in my life um, but the idea that it was going to be a sort of money spinner or something, <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Mm. Um, and, and, and I think it's only fair that you are the person who tells this part of your story and, and it, I've only read things and I suppose experienced things. Um, but, but there was a, a backlash from the people who live on Brick Lane, um, which, which seemed bemusing uh, to, to, to many of us. Um, but what was your experience of it as you're the rightful person who really lived through it? Yeah, uh, well, it, well, I mean, it was interesting. It was basically around the, the filming. So that was a few years later. But the, the, the narrative seems to be, and it's hard to shift a narrative once it's taken root, um, that people with a Bangladeshi heritage um, you know, didn't like Brick Lane, which, you know, couldn't be further from the truth of my experience. I mean, I've had so many readers with a Bangladeshi heritage, not just here, but all around the world, um, who have written to me or spoken to me at events and so on, and just, you know, actually, the book spoke to them, they wanted to talk to me about what it meant to them. So it's been the total opposite of this narrative. Um, however, there were one or two older, conservative, um, self-appointed, I believe, leaders um, in the area who decided that the, the, they were offended by the book, never having read it, which, you know, if, which they said in interviews. Um, so they promised book burnings and said there would be a demonstration and sort of hinted at violence, you know, that they themselves were peaceful, but they couldn't account for what other, other younger people might do and the film producers decided to relocate the filming away from Brick Lane as a result of that which um, I mean, it didn't harm the film they just filmed elsewhere but you know it, it, it's I remember I was I was I, I used to be patron of the the Atlee um, youth club around there um, and I was I was at the the youth club 
filming for something else for a, an interview. And one of the journalists there, a photog oh, photographer actually, said that he'd covered the demonstration and he, he said there were more um, members of the media there than there were demonstrators. That he'd had to get in really close to make it sort of look as though it was a, a demonstration. And the director of the movie, Sarah Gavron, uh, she told me that a thousand people had queued to be ex local people in the area had queued to be extras in the film, which is against like 40, 50 people, all men, apart from two women apparently, um, who took part in the demonstration. So that sort of gives you the balance. I know you do a lot of yoga. Um, yeah. And, and, and find, I hope, a lot of joy and, and perhaps to some degree some therapy. Has anxiety uh, or, or depression ever touched your life at all? Yeah, you, for sure. kind enough to share that with us? Yeah, um, I, mean, I mean, I think I'm sort of anxious by, well, I was going to say disposition, but how much of that disposition is conditioned by um, the way that you've grown up. Um, but yeah, I'm sort of habitually anxious. Um, you know, it, it shouldn't matter to you what people are saying. It shouldn't matter how much, you know, your writing is derided and, mm. and trampled on. You, you, you've always done what you want to do, Monica. You believe in the work, that should be enough. So I felt very sort of feeble um, for for getting depressed and the sort of self-loathing mm. <laughs> comes in to play at that point. Um, and I was, you know, I was never so depressed that I couldn't function. So I had children to get to school and stuff like that, but I would get them to school and some days I would just go back to bed. And um, there was a time when I, you know, I, I decided I'd better not carry on writing because it will just <laughs> be, be um, more trouble than it's worth. There was a time when I couldn't even read. I just could not read and I read all my life. I've been a huge reader. It's such a central thing in my life. And there was a time when I couldn't even bring myself to pick up a novel. I'm shocked actually hearing from you that at some point you weren't even able to read up a book. Mm. to read given how passionate you are about reading and from the privilege we've had of hearing about your journey. Can you explain to us and educate me and for the benefit of other people who may be feeling that, and we've, we've heard of many other people, JK Rowling once went through exceptional depression and, and it's clear in her books as well. What made you seek help, whether it was the NHS or not, what made you seek help um, what form that help took and what benefit it's had for you? you see, I think when I was really down, I was too down <laughs> to, go get, to go and get help. And I was too um, moment to moment getting through and focusing all my energy on raising my children and that was the only priority and everything else had to go on the back burner and it's only really um what the last four or five years that i've had the kind of Well, the, well, I was going to say the time, but it's not even really the time. It's, I've given myself permission. I think that's what it is. I, I've given myself permission to say it's okay to go and get some help. And what has been the benefit of, of having therapy? I think that I'm kinder to myself. <laughs> I think that's... Um, that, well, that, that there's a, a place to go and talk about yourself and that time you're supposed to talk about yourself. 
So you don't have that feeling of, oh, really, Monica, what are you moaning on about? <laughs> so, so there's that contained space and that contained time where, again, you're given permission to do that. And what I've learned from it is really to be l less judgmental of myself um, and to also to think about the, <clears throat> the little girl that I was and, um, you know, uh, sort of acknowledge that she had a bit of a harder time <laughs> than <laughs> I'd ever really admitted. I think you underplay it massively, I think. And this is the great privilege that I have in being able to hear your story. I think you went through an incredible upheaval multiple times, as did your parents and your siblings. Uh, and, and now you're the wonderful person that you are. So I'm glad to hear you at least acknowledge it um, of everything you went through. In the latter parts of our interview, were there any stories directly with the NHS or healthcare that you've had alongside your journey? Well, I've been very lucky in terms of my own health and my family's health. So my only um, experiences with the NHS have really been around the birth of my children, um, which have been great experiences. Um, I believe another thing that you suffer from is insomnia. And has that ever bothered you in any way or it's something that you just adapt to? Yeah, I mean, actually, it's been so much better in recent years. Um, so it started, it started when my son was born. I mean, I don't want to blame him. <laughs> I am blaming him. <laughs> he, he was a really bad sleeper when he was a baby, so he'd wake up a lot. I mean, uh, you know, probably no more than most babies, but I had a problem. He'd go back to sleep, and I had a problem getting back to sleep when I'd fed him and put him down. I just couldn't get back to sleep. So I did um, start to feel very anxious about that. But then I decided instead of worrying about being awake, why don't I just do something constructive? And I started writing short stories in, in the night. I mean, this was before I started on the novel that turned into Brick Lane. So, but that's how I sort of cut my teeth writing short stories in the night when I was feeling insomniac. And I was very, you know, I, w I was very tired in the day, but it, it, it kind of saved me because rather than feeling resentful and, oh God, you know, isn't it awful that I'm awake? I thought, well, here I am, I'm learning something. And there's also something quite magical about those early hours of the morning yes. yeah. when everything exactly. is still yeah. and you feel like you're the only person awake going back to your depression if if i was to ask you to put all of your worst experiences and, and summarize them in, in in a day of of the things you wouldn't be able to do word associations just so that people who suffer from it can relate but also perhaps more people people who have no notion of what depression is and, and, and really are quite dismissive of it, that you're just sad or you're tired and not appreciate the debilitating effect it can have. Mm. And people will see you, they will see your success, they will see your acclaim and have no idea of the crippling effects it clearly had. And so if you could gift me with that and share with the rest of us, at its very worst moments, what depression can be like. <sighs> it's like wading through porridge with chains around your ankles. And it's that heaviness, sky pressing down on you. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it's a kind of bleakness inside, you know, the weather conditions inside are just like sleet. Yeah. 
And, the, and, and, and in some ways it does feel like fatigue. In some ways it feels like, you know, you've run a marathon and you've just got, no, you've got nothing left. Within the NHS and the challenges we've been facing, there are burned out surgeons, doctors, nurses, medical students, nursing students, receptionists, porters, other healthcare professionals. If you had the opportunity, and you do, what message would you give to them, given the current pandemic and, and perhaps really the whole healthcare journey that we've all been on? It's just a message of gratitude, and I'm so in awe of what they do day in, day out. I mean, going out there and helping others who are in need. I mean, sort of puts me to shame sitting at my desk. Um, what I would say to them is thank you and I hope you will get the pay rise that you so, so deserve. Yes, thank you so, so much. And thank you so much for this wonderful interview. I'm so, so grateful for all of your precious time. And I think we've generally had some really wonderful stories that will help so, so many people, which I have no doubt. So I'm so grateful mm. to you. Well, thank you. I enjoyed talking to you. Oh, thank, thank you. you.